Will, good to see you. Good to see you. Did you notice my fancy shirt? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, Toronto Raptors, ladies and gentlemen. Good for you. Need I say more? This is post game one at this point. Try not to rain on my parade. Uh, they gave out this shirt. I was at the game, actually. Mm -hmm. And this is the shirt that was on the chair. So this is evidence of my support for the team. And what is that? It's uh, a shirt of all the Raptors. Yeah, it's logos. got all the uh, it's got all the logos. Classic, new, old. I'm pretty happy about it. Yeah, looks nice. So shout out to the Raptors. Up 1-0 on the Golden State Warriors. Golden State Warriors fans, I feel for you. Nevertheless, the saga continues. The series continues. And a Kawhi Leonard billboard pops up in Golden State territory. The king of the north is coming. All right, so game three. This is a weird uh, billboard. You're not happy with that billboard, Will? It just looks really badly designed. But really? I think it's really straightforward. Maybe that's the idea, Will. It's, I think it's supposed to look sort of old school. You see yeah. how New Balance is going with that like Times New Roman thing, whatever the font is there? It looks like old Nike, like Jordan-era Nike. Right simple lines. I think they know what they're doing, and I think the big loser in this NBA Finals is Nike, specifically. They got no player. Durant is out, mm -hmm. and the biggest name left in the playoffs, Kawhi Leonard, people are calling him the best player in the league at this point, New Balance is with New Balance. And then there's a bunch of Adidas guys like Lowry and others. Like, I would, I would be curious, when's the last NBA Final that Nike didn't have a major play because they had LeBron for so long. He was in every single finals and they gave him like half a billion dollars. So they're missing out here. They're wishing that they gave Kawhi every penny because he's getting the Jordan comparisons now. And if they go on to win this title and he's he's got the New Balance badge, that's a missed opportunity, man. man I saw after they won... Game six against Milwaukee, Nike had to tweet out a picture of Norman, Norman Powell. They had to go down to Ross. Nothing against Norman Powell. Shout out Norman, Norman Powell. I mean, it's been a huge part of, of the, the Raptors to this point, getting to this point. But you see where I'm, you see where I'm going here. They had to go down the roster mm -hmm. to get a, an athlete they could tweet about. So Nike missed out on this. Anyhow. Into the tech news, Willie Do. We're back to Huawei, US, China, trade, 5G, rare earths. It's a package deal. It's a combo. That's like you get a burger, you get some fries with your burger. You know? Mm. That's just the that's just the status right now. It's getting it's this one is particularly harsh. The headline: China prepares to strike back at U.S. as Huawei suffers another loss. I mean, it's rough. You told me about this as soon as I came in today. SoftBank, big carrier in Japan, I hear. Is that yeah, right? They're huge. Huge. Well, they were off to the races uh, previously having purchased equipment from Huawei, and they were sort of uh, in talks to upgrade their equipment to 5G stuff like the rest of the world. And they were they were making progress with Huawei. And now they're backing off. They've officially stated that they will not be working with Huawei. They've snubbed them. Even though they had been their 4G supplier uh, in the past. And instead they're going with Nokia, right? Is that right, Will? I think Nokia or Ericsson. They're going with another option. And a lot of people are speculating that this is, as a consequence, equipment from both Nokia and Ericsson snubbing Huawei. Okay, so a lot of people are speculating like this is, of course, to do with the ban in the U.S., the executive order, the, the, the new attention being placed on Huawei and their equipment, and other countries now reacting, companies, private companies like SoftBank, reacting, potentially changing their trajectory based on all these happenings. And the see, the thing here is, as these kinds of decisions pile up, 
then the, the pressure is on. The, the pressure continues to increase because now it's like, when do you respond? If these contracts all fall out and these dollars get spent elsewhere, and these are long-term contracts, like if they decide to go a different path, there's no next opportunity to get back into that network. Yeah, you're, you're basically building an infrastructure from scratch. So all your expansion from that, that point forward, all your maintenance, you keep coming back to this customer, client, customer. What? You keep coming back to this supplier as a customer is what I mean to say. So Huawei, they work hard to get out in front with this 5G gear and to, to also be able to deliver it at an affordable cost. And then like it seems, it seems like overnight, wiped, clean. And who knows what's going on behind closed doors? All we have, we have the interview with the CEO. He seems cool. He seemed chilled out. He's like, we'll figure it out. He was like, uh, you know, it's like an airplane needs wings. We got a hole in the wings. We're going to repair the wings. Like that was his analogy. But maybe behind closed doors is different. Maybe behind closed doors, he's on the phone like, hey, let's go. Politicians, people in office, let's make some moves here. I'm getting killed out in the street in the tech game. They're all coming after me because that's the way it feels right now. It feels like they got a big target on their back specifically. So anyhow, it looks like the wheels are beginning to uh, move a little bit. The wheels are in motion for some sort of trade retaliation, specifically targeting the rare earth conversation, which has popped up in this show a few times. And at first it was strictly speculative. At first it was uh, some strategic photo op followed by a, a, a couple of loose claims. And then now... Within this article, they say specifically that like some message ran out, right? Like there was an actual broadcast. Where is it here? Bloomberg reports that China has put preparations in place to restrict exports of rare earth minerals to the U.S. And also, China has set up its own unreliable entities list. So you see... <laughs> Everyone can have an entity list, Will. Mm. You know? They could they could throw you on that list. I'm already on it. You're an entity. Did you know that? An entity doesn't have to just be a company. It can be an individual as well. Part of the reason they use that term. Huh. You can put a person on the list. Will he do? Not safe. I'm number one. You never know what he's going to He's at the top of the entity list. Anyhow. Uh... So, yeah, so th there was a, a, like a, a sort of semi-official statement here. Trade war deepening, um, broadcast nationally. There's going to be uh, some sort of response. It seems to be clear now. So it's piling up on both sides. The markets have reacted. Everything is weak. Everything is soft. It ain't looking good right now. Unless you're Nokia and Ericsson. Then you're like... You're having a party every day. Mm -hmm. You're just, you just, you, you, you wake up in the morning, you throw this show on, you kick your feet up. I got some new shoes, by the way. So kick the feet up. You see this right here? Go check out the main channel. The video might not be up yet. Very high tech shoes. Okay. And uh, definitely not the ones that Will's looking up right now. <laughs> Like baby shoes? I got very high-tech shoes, okay? 3D printed shoes. It's a long story, but you can go check out the uh, the video on Unbox Therapy. Uh, but anyhow, yeah, if you're Nokia or Ericsson, well, you come into work, you get yourself a coffee, you get yourself a donut, you throw on this show, and then you just count the orders coming in as this stuff piles up and, and, and companies like SoftBank and Verizon and AT&T and every regional carrier calls you up and says, hey, we need to do something here because we can't, we can't be buying Huawei stuff anymore. They're the only ones really at this moment in time. I'm sure there are others that are benefiting from this situation, maybe Samsung, who knows. But uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's what I can say about the matter. 
And we'll see what happens with the whole 5G situation now that these alterations have taken place. I'm curious. Nokia and Ericsson, they're getting referenced a lot. Can they deliver? What's the rollout look like? What's the effect? What's going to happen to the, the speed at which this transition to 5G could take place? It's all very interesting. And then the rare earths thing. If they do put this in place, there's some, there's some mixed reports on this, how big of an effect this could have. Certainly the markets wouldn't like it. Apparently one of the, one of the most important minerals, the neodymium, neodymium that is used in magnets, it's using a lot of uh, a lot of uh, electronics products, including your headphones. Your headphones have huge magnets in them. Well, you might not have known that. And so, if there's a, a cutback on those exports, sure, maybe they it can come from elsewhere. Maybe it's not so rare. But you gotta believe there's gonna be a slowdown in, in in the wide variety of enterprises that rely on the current flow of rare earths that has been set up via China. So. Anyhow, China prepares to strike back. It sound like a, sounds like we're getting into, back into Star Wars territory. Mm -hmm. China strikes back. I mean, these headlines, it's unbelievable. Yeah. 2019. Now, uh, staying in the, uh, in the tech segment here, but moving into some software, Apple is expected to retire iTunes after 18 years, that'll make you feel old. The idea that iTunes has been around for 18 years. Everybody hates iTunes. I never met anyone, nor have I read a single article from somebody praising iTunes. Like for it's, It seems to be the most hated software that everyone needs to use and uses reluctantly. iTunes has been the way Apple users listen to music, watch movies and TV shows, hear podcasts, and manage their devices for almost two decades. This year... Apple is finally ready to move into a new era. The company is launching a trio of new apps for the Mac, music, TV, and podcasts to replace iTunes. That matches Apple's media app strategy on iPhones and iPads. Without iTunes, customers can manage their Apple gadgets through the music app. So this is a long time coming, as I just mentioned. iTunes, a holdover from an age, from a technological age, that no longer exists. It's come and gone. It, it's funny. You show this old screenshot of what iTunes looked like in 2001. And obviously it's changed a little bit over the years. But it's still like this long list. The artist name. the owner, Like that still exists in modern iTunes. And just glancing at it now. It feels so antiquated. It feels like so many apps that existed in that era in 2001. You remember like whatever you had. Real Player. and Winamp. Winamp and the various ways that people listen to mp3s and it just it's true it really feels weird in this era the name of it feels weird in this era apple has their own music service now you're getting tv in there and podcasting it's quite confusing it's the place you sync your device uh so i think this is probably a good thing you got to move on at a certain point kind of crazy though because itunes as we look back now Drastic impact on the music industry. You know, the deal that was cut with the music industry, Apple, that Apple was able to achieve with the, with the music industry there, the 30% uh, cut or whatever it was, unprecedented. Panicking, scrambling in the, in the, in the face of products like Napster, you may recall, and, and uh, Piracy and Metallica. Remember all that stuff? Mm -hmm. And so iTunes... Apple, they struck at the perfect moment. Let's cut a deal. We'll get you some money. We'll get you a little bit of money. And of course, at the time, everyone, all the artists were like, the ones who signed up, some of them, a lot of them still weren't happy. They were like, hey, this, this cut is too big. And they, and they weren't happy with iTunes even back then. And then you come to the Apple Music Spotify era and everyone's like wishing it was back like it was with iTunes when they could get a dollar 99 cents for a track because now they get a penny for a play or half a penny. They would love a penny for a play. What am I talking about? Half a penny. I don't know what it is. Everybody's, no one's happy. And, and, and in the meantime, creating content, making music, more people than ever doing it. So, but you look at this, this is a throwback. This is definitely, it's a time machine looking at 
the what iTunes looked like in 2001. And as I mentioned, a lot of people found it to be a headache as far as uh, the software was concerned. It seemed like Apple was just keeping it around because it, it was just kind of, you know, it was there. It did what it was supposed to do, and and, and so what? But it, it definitely doesn't seem like it belongs in 2019. And uh, so I think Apple's making a good move here. You put it to bed. iTunes can go take a nap, and now you have the separate apps. I can see some people maybe don't like to have all these different apps, but it just makes sense because iTunes grew to become all these weird different things all in one. Apple has ambitions in the TV department, as we saw in their most recent keynote. And, of course, podcasts have become a big part of... Uh, of people's consumption habits in the content segment that doesn't really fit as well on iTunes as well. I already noticed that we publish this podcast in audio only format and there's two separate sections, one for iTunes, one for Apple podcasts. So I say the writing was on the wall here. We sort of saw this coming. Now, of course you can listen to it elsewhere. Will's just reminding me right now. It's not, of course you don't have to go to Apple podcasts. You can go to Google podcasts, Google play pocket cats. You can get the audio version of this in a lot of places. But anyhow, iTunes getting retired at WWDC. Get ready for the new apps. Hopefully they're decent. Uh, they're going to be separate. So that's that. I say uh, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. you, you did your duty. Farewell, iTunes. sweet prince. Is that? Good night, sweet prince. Is that the meme? I don't know. I don't. Farewell. I don't know. What can I? iTunes, I'm telling you, no one's going to sh shed a single tear on this. The, 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 those, the iTunes lovers are not out there. In fact, if you're an iTunes lover and you don't want it to go anywhere, leave a comment. I bet you there won't be a single one. Well, there will be now, but... You didn't have any fond memories? No. None at all? No! Okay. iTunes, it's a nightmare. Everyone knows that. Next up... Uh, have you noticed, Will, have you heard about this idea of OLED displays on gaming laptops? OLED displays making their way into laptops. Don't you find it odd that it's taken so long? We've had OLED displays on smartphones. We talk about it so much. They're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Superior on smartphones. And you wonder, why are they not in every single laptop at this point? Well, there are some concerns. And some of them are coming up now because, of course... We talked about it previously. Computex happening right now or just finished happening. And many new laptops announced with OLED panels, with the option at least to be available. And some of them being showcased without plans for options. But nonetheless, there seems to be certain demand for OLED panels in laptops. So some manufacturers are doing it. Others remain concerned. And so I thought it would be an interesting topic to cover. I think end users should probably know the potential drawbacks of having an OLED display in a laptop as opposed to a smartphone. So your smartphone, uh, there's not a lot of static images. When you are on the phone, you're moving around a lot mm. from, from screen to screen. You're also frequently locking it completely. You're not likely to just leave it on with the screen on on the main page for very long. And of course, you can see where I'm going with this. The fear, potential fear here, or uh, the concern that you could have about OLED in a laptop is you have tons of static images on the display. Now you might say, but wait, I can use a screensaver. I'm talking about, for example, this is Windows. I'm talking about even the little bar on the bottom here. That's always there. Except, for example, if I full screen something, I don't know, like a game or a browser or something like this, that there might be some retention there, image retention. So Will's showcasing some, some ghosting on an ROG laptop. It can happen, by the way, on, on other screen technology as well. It doesn't have to be exclusively OLED, but OLED, presumably, the thinking is, is a little bit more susceptible than other technologies. So... Yes, you're going to get this incredible, uh, uh, saturated appearance of OLED. You're going to get this uh, almost unbelievable uh, contrast ratio that we've all experienced on TVs, phones. But it turns out a computer monitor, the attributes you're looking for are actually a little different. 
The other potential concern is in relationship to color accuracy. So even though OLEDs are beautiful, if you're using your display for any type of work, then you may be concerned with getting color accuracy on par with something like an IPS panel. And of course, so many manufacturers will still continue to offer IPS options for, inter for individuals that are interested. But for those that, that, that opt for the OLED display, what I'm hearing is that manufacturers are going to attempt to come up with software that runs in the background of, an o of the OLED laptop to do some pixel shifting in an attempt to diminish the effect of, of uh, image retention. So there is a possibility this is going to get figured out. I sure hope it does because you can see the difference right here. Will has a picture side by side of an AMOLED display gaming laptop versus an IPS and the colors and the black level on the OLED. It's just a wonderful thing to look at. So I hope it gets figured out. But in the meantime, I would be a little bit careful about spending a bunch of money on one of the, one of the first generation OLED gaming laptops. I probably stick to the older tech for now until we can see what happens with image persistence, image uh, retention, and so forth. Okay, Will, I don't know if you heard about I don't know if you heard about this one. Uh, Google putting an end to ad blocking. This is funny because we it came up on the show multiple times. You go to a website, we're trying to do the show where we flip back and forth and cut to Will's screen. And many times ads have been problematic in the experience of us doing that in a smooth fashion. And then he had an ad blocker and then people, you guys were like, why is he running an ad blocker to show your show relies on ads? And it, it, it's a great point. We, we use it for the purpose of this broadcast to try to have a streamline because you've been on the Internet. You know what the average ad load of a website is and it can be bananas. I mean, it can really overwhelm the entire site experience and it's just gotten a bit out of hand. And so people gravitate towards these ad blockers, understandably. And for the most part, up until now, Google's been okay with it. They've been okay with these blockers in the form of browser plugins, browser extensions on Chrome. Now they're backing away from it. And there's speculation as to why, but many people can't help, can't resist the idea that, hey, Google's an ad company. <laughs> why are they going to make it easier for you to skip ads? They don't, it's the, they're not just delivering ads in places like YouTube. A lot of the ad experiences you're having elsewhere on the web are baked into Google's ad AdWords, AdSense product, sorry. Uh, so they're all over the place. Now, they're going to make a change that's going to affect everyone except their enterprise customers. And the short explanation is that Google plans to eliminate the ability to block ads before the browser loads them which is the most uh, common form of ad blocking extension. They use it, they, they operate in that fashion. Uh, there are of course other browsers, there's other ways around this, but I thought it would be an interesting jumping off point to talk about the concept in general. Now I wish advertising was elegant. I mean, that'd be great if it was subtle and elegant. <laughs> If you could land on a web page and there's a single ad over on the right hand side, I don't know that many people would be gravitating towards installing a th some sort of third party extension. They might just live with it. But when you get hit, when you get blasted with the 100 ads, then that's when you start looking. So that's the first part of the conversation. Now, recently, there have emerged new options for interacting with the content you like, because I think it's important for us all to get this out of the way. If you want good stuff on the internet, somebody's got to pay for it. Like it's at some point it has to be subsidized by something. And if you don't want to spend actual money on it, then the thing that you're exchanging that you're trading in is your attention. So you see the ad, you get the thing for free, well, in exchange for your attention, and you get to move on with your life. So doing neither was always kind of a weird solution, right? Here you're on this website, you really like what you're reading, or maybe you're on YouTube, you really like what you're watching, but you feel like not only should you get it, but you also shouldn't look at ads. I mean, I'm, I'm a YouTube user, just like I'm a YouTube creator, content creator. And 
So for me, that wasn't really plausible. It didn't make sense in my head. I'm like, man, if I want to see more of this content, I have to, there has to be some sort of transaction that takes place at some point, whether through the form of ads or some sort of payment. And so YouTube or Google, Google in the, the through YouTube started to offer up this premium, uh, this premium product, which I jumped on immediately. And I don't know if I've promoted it to you guys, probably not, but like, it's a really simple product. It gives you ad-free YouTube and YouTube music, access to YouTube originals, and YouTube music premium, which includes offline as well. Background play and offline. You can download videos. And yeah, it costs money, but you get YouTube music, which is kind of like a Spotify and it's a similar price, but you get all that other stuff as a bonus. Plus, I can tell you from being a content creator, I the the content creator gets a percentage of your overall subscription fee as a as a means for support for the content that you're watching here on the platform. So here is an example of an alternative model, which allows you to skip out on ads, but still participate in the transaction that needs to take place for content to remain the way that you want to watch it. See, because the thing is, if everybody just goes out and says, I don't want to do either, I'm just going to turn on the ad blocker or I'm no longer going to use Chrome. I'm just going to go use some other browser that lets me continue to use my ad blocker. Well, you could pr presumably content at some point suffers be or content creators end up having to bake adver more advertising into the content itself, which again, not always the most elegant approach. Some some do a better job than others of doing so. So anyhow, it's, it's, it's kind of a controversial topic. I'm speaking from, I'm trying my best to speak from both point of views, the point of view of the user and the point of view of the content creator. I just think that you can't, you can't have it all, you know, at some point you gotta just do the math mentally and recognize that on some level, if you want the thing that you enjoy to keep happening, there has to be some kind of exchange. So feel free to do as you please. Maybe if there's a, a particular website that is, is, is egregious in your estimation as to how they treat advertising, maybe block that site and then, and then free up some others where you feel like you wanna contribute through, through viewing ads or whatnot. But I, I, I even see the limitation in that. That gets troublesome too, because now it's like, let's say each website comes up with a YouTube premium, a website premium. And now what do you have? You have all these $10, $10 subscriptions. I mean, it's bananas. It gets too, it gets crazy. It's, I don't think anyone's prepared for it. I think the ad subsidized web is the majority of the web. And it, it's, 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 it makes the most sense operationally for most users. So there has to be a middle ground found. I don't know what you guys think that it is. I know when I get the option, if it's a place that I frequent or content that I frequently engage with, if I do get the option to just pay a couple dollars to remove the advertising, that's the way I do it. But I also can completely appreciate if that's not a possibility for, for you as well. And you want to watch an ad to, to support, it's the same difference. It's, uh, it, keeps, uh, it keeps the shop doors open, as Ryan likes to say. So, but anyway, Google's going to make it harder, at least through Chrome. I think a lot of people are just going to switch browsers, but I don't know that ne that, that necessarily solves the problem long term. So, all right, last one for me, Will. Did you know, um, did you know that Godzilla has been getting bigger? No. He's been getting a lot bigger. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So... He's evolved 30 times faster than any real creature since his first appearance in 1954. He's, uh, he's grown really fast. He started out 164 feet tall. And he's all the way up to 300, 390 feet now. So he's evolving rapidly. And there's a new study that came out that has a suggestion as to how or why he is evolving faster than anything that actually exists. And so researchers compared the so-called king of the monsters rate of evolution with 2,500 other animals. And they found, of course, it's completely ridiculous. Well, because he's, uh, 
uh, a fabrication, a human invention. Well, he got really, he got a, a lot bigger between seven, 1973 and 1984. He got a lot bigger. Anyhow, their finding, or at least their speculation, or their uh, their guess uh, as to why this is the case, is that Godzilla is actually a map for human fear. He's a he's a his existence and evolution follows alongside our greatest fears as human beings. And they went a step further and said that the scale of Godzilla has to do with the scale of potential destruction that humans could apply to one another. In other words, there's a Godzilla connection to nuclear warfare. <laughs> oh. That's what, I don't know, man. That's what they're saying here, okay? And uh, that as the potential for catastrophe increases in magnitude, because Godzilla is represented, representative in monster form of potential for catastrophe. The bigger the potential catastrophe, the bigger the potential fear, the bigger Godzilla needs to be. Mm. This is their findings. I don't know. I mean, it seems like a reach for me. I, I, I kind of get it. I kind of get where they're coming from. But, I mean, it could just be... It could just be that if you're going to do the movie over again, why not make him bigger? Yeah. You know, and also, I mean, I I kind of get their point. Um, Godzilla is kind of like this one figure. It's not like which which represents like a nuclear bomb or something. Well, because I, I didn't even know this. I mean, obviously, I obviously should have known this, but that's the or original reason he came up from the bo the depth of the ocean. Yeah, it's because of nuclear testing. Because of nuclear testing, because of radiation, he came up to see what's going on. Why are you guys messing with me? So. There's obviously that connection there. Now, does, has the threat or the fear increased substantially since the original 1954 video? I, I guess. I don't know. I think it's gone through phases, though. Yeah, the, see, like in this video, he seemed to have shrunk down a bit. He shrunk. In 2017. He shrunk. He went, he went big, then he went small, then he went big again. I don't know, man. It, it, look. You can. What can you do with this? I feel like he's destined. Yeah, look how big he is. Now. <laughs> I feel like he's destined to get bigger. I just, if you keep making these movies long enough, he's gonna get. What are you gonna do? Like he's not gonna become human size. So which way are you gonna go? How is your movie gonna be that much more compelling than the last one? Just make him bigger. If all of a sudden he just stomp, and you know what I mean? Well, which other way do you go? How do you make your thing yours? Mm -hmm. But. I don't know. Yeah, he, sometimes he's a protector of uh, Earth. Sometimes Godzilla fights is good. other monsters. Sometimes Godzilla's good. I, I think I read somewhere, um, you know, a scientist kind of looked into how Godzilla exists, and like the physics apparently don't work when he's on land because it's so heavy. Like all the meat that's on his body, like he literally can't sustain himself. He can't stand up. He wouldn't be upright. Yeah, he he would. Be yeah. far much better if he was in water. This is where the people in the comments go, Will, it's a movie. Can you please yeah, know, stop? Like, uh, yeah. Can you please relax? <laughs> you know? That's I still where, enjoy it. I'm just, saying the cool. pe I'm just saying the people say that. I'm yeah. not saying I say that. Uh, but anyway, they're trying to... You can read the article for yourself, see if you buy into it, but they're trying to say he maps to human fear levels. He goes up and down. He gets bigger as a uh, human angst gets bigger. What do they say? A shifting allegory for our fears from the H-bomb to climate change. You see, I don't know how deep you want to get. It gets a bit sappy, to be honest. Mm. You know? So you got to draw your own conclusions on that. But he's set to be really big, right? I don't know. He's coming out again in 2019. Yep. And, uh, and he, it's the biggest he's ever been. 390 feet, right? Is that the one you have? No, see, he's bigger than this now. What does that one say? 318? I, don't, I think he's bigger than that, what you're showing me right there. I don't know. Anyway, he's massive. They say 390 feet tall. So you got a big Godzilla. Anyway, well, we're, we're moving on now. We got to keep it moving. Do you have something you want to talk about? Um, T-Series? Yes. They uh, recently passed 100 million 100 million. 100 million, no big deal. Uh, what can I say? It was destined to happen. 
it was inevitable. T-Series, 100 million subscribers. Of course, they had the PewDiePie race going on, but it was like, it was just kind of obvious as an outsider tracking the numbers. T-Series was uh, set to demolish planet Earth. And uh, look, I'm, I'm, YouTube has increasingly become this global, this global medium. That's really what the T-Series story is about. It's about access to content, regardless of where you are in the world. It's about access to content, regardless of which device you happen to be on. It's about access to co content on your terms. Pick up where you left off. I mean, it's everything that the traditional television industry was not or could not possibly be because of technological advancement and, and all the things that took place for YouTube to become what it's become. For YouTube to become the thing that allows this, this show to exist. And so this number right here, I mean, it's just a number, obviously, but I, for me, it's representative of a shift of a change in the global landscape. For me, this is 100 million people online interacting with YouTube, interacting with the platform that I'm speaking on. I'm sure some of these 100 million people are here watching this right now. I'm sure there's a T-Series subscriber watching this right now. And sort of showcasing how the global landscape for content is no longer one-dimensional. It's no longer in one place, housed in one city. It's no longer just Hollywood, Will. It's no longer just New York City. It's spread out now. It's everywhere for everyone. And you, you pick, you choose. Democratized content. You know, you've seen all kinds of traditional media come to this platform. I don't know where T-Series actually stacks up because my understanding is some of this stuff goes on TV there. Some of it goes on YouTube there. I don't really know how it's distributed. But increasingly, YouTube is becoming, and the internet is becoming the first screen, not the second screen anymore, that... The audiences represented here are bigger, more enthusiastic, motivated than the other screen, the traditional media screen, which, which sort of uh, dominated for so long. So I'm celebrating this 100 million. I'm not celebrating it like they beat PewDiePie or whatever. I'm obviously not talking about it in that context. I'm just saying it showcases the power of the platform and it showcases how many people are connecting via this platform. And for me, that's exciting. Shout out to India. Shout out to everybody watching from India, by the way. All right, well, you got some questions for us today or what? Yes, we do. Couple of questions. Hi, Lou. Hi, Will. I've been following your show for a long time now in Belgium, Europe. Love the show. Love the tech. Keep doing what you guys do. Thank you very much. I've got the following question for you. If you have the abilities... What would you like to invent in the tech world yourself? What's your idea of tech you would like that's currently not available? Mm hmm. What tech do I need that's not available? Well, obviously, all the stuff I'm actually working on, I can't tell you about because mm. it's top secret. I can't even tell Will about it. Yeah. So I'm going to have to go even further. You know what? what you know what, know what, Will? You want to know what would be great? This is simple. This is a simple one. Just the Star Trek one where they can just go from spot to spot instantly. Oh, like beam? Beam, Just beam me. Just beam me somewhere. You know? Because I'm not lazy enough as it stands. So, maybe just I have to be in a place. Like last night I was trying to get to the Raptors game. Imagine if I could just hit the button and be in the seat. Because I had to get downtown... I had to get parking. There were the crowds. I guess in Star Trek, they just beam like from one spot in the ship to another spot in the ship. That's all they do there. Um, oh, they can beam anywhere. Yeah. 
spaceship to planet. That's how okay. they get down to Okay, the be, they can beam anywhere. Then in that case, that's what I'm inventing. Beaming. I'm beaming anywhere. Uh, that's why that device we had Ryan on in the past was called the beam. Yeah. Uh, if I could beam to my seat at the Raptors game, I think I'd go to every game. Just beam in, beam out. The travel. Now, I'm lucky. I don't have a crazy commute or anything, but I know a lot of people do. And you definitely can't beam, so you sit in your car or on a train. Thank goodness you could also thank goodness you could listen to this show though. Mm. You see, that's kind of it's almost as good as beaming there. Did you know that, Will? No. <laughs> Obviously, it's not as good as beaming there, but nonetheless, that's what I would invent. It's that's impossible. That's hard. Maybe the but, guy was speaking more practically, but I don't care. We're having fun on this show. I'm inventing beam technology. Hold on, hold on. What if uh, someone got a hold of your technology and then beams to your place or something, taking a shower? Why you got to take it there, Will? <laughs> Why you got to disturb me like that? I guess it's for your own personal. You got to have. You're not going to share it for everyone, right? Because if that's the case. He did say tech product, so place. I do have to share it. It's a great question, Will. I love what you're doing here. You bring up a great point. If you can really beam anywhere, how? Okay, I got it. You have a no beam zone or private beam zone, like Maybe your just house, like to public areas. You yes, can beam to public. Yeah, and there would be portal spots. So if I want to go to the Raptors game, it's not right to my seat, but it's like an exchange spot. But then, don't I have the same crowds and the same traffic? Ah, you beam onto someone's lap. I guess the key here, Will, is like any great tech product. If you want it to be exclusive, it just has to be expensive. Yeah, you see. You find a way to do it. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. We're talking about Star Trek. I don't know. Let's get the next question going. My question is rather simple, and apologies if it's been asked before, but that's a really cool desk that Lou is sat at. What's it called? Where's it from? What's the story behind it? Uh, you know what? This is new. It is a walnut tree. Well, it's a sliver. Well, it's more than a sliver. It's a chunk of a walnut tree. It's a live edge. It's a real, this is a real tree when you bet. It's a tree with some very cool uh, hand welded legs for it. It's a place called Anglewood where I got it from. And they just, they just kind of made it up for me. I think it, I think it's really, it's a nice place to sit, to be honest. I'm really happy with it so far to interact with the natural the truly natural not not a veneer not to patch together but instead like an actual tree trunk i feel like i'm sitting with nature it's got a smell to it a texture so you're right it's it's really fantastic it's about i think it's eight feet long but the uh the guy with the company anglewood he thought it would work that this particular slab would work really well as a desk because of the shape of it, the natural shape of it. And he was right. He th This desk, though, has me looking at trees completely differently. I drive around, I'm like, huh, you need a really big tree to get a desk like this, like a really old tree. You try to count the rings, it takes a long time to have something like this. But uh, I, I love the natural stuff. There's two things I really like, Will. What's that? Wood and leather. Mm. Nothing else. That's it. That's all I like. That's all you talk about. I love wood. I love leather. And I love the combination of both. What was the thing that George St. Pierre said? There are three things. There are three things he likes. Jack, do you remember that? Dinosaurs, women, and the violence of the octagon. Those are the only things GS GSP likes. Or that get him excited. <laughs> What excites GSP? What excites GSP? Here's his answer. A woman, of course, dinosaurs, and the violence of the octagon. So, besides those three things, I would like to add wood, some good, high-quality wood, a tree if you can, and uh, some top-grain, full-grain leather. That's, uh, I'm putting that at the top of the list. All right, let's do one more question, Will. Perhaps a red line territory. Whoa, how about a subject uh -oh. line there? Hi, Lou and Will. I would totally understand if you don't want to get into this rabbit hole. What a way to start a question. Should we just cut now? 
Willie do hitting me with that kind of intro to a question. But I hope you'd at least entertain this. Well, I guess we're entertaining it. It's too late to back out now. How religious do you believe yourself to be from one to ten? One being an atheist and ten being undetermined whether it's time to go full-time preaching. <laughs> Have a nice day. Oh, man. Will, what are you doing here? What kind of show are you running here, Will? What are you trying to do? I'm trying to convert you. Here's the thing. Uh, it's the term religious. It's the term. People getting hung up in the term, you know? The, and the practices. The term, the practices, the whole, the whole nine. It's, a, it's hard to put your, your finger on it. I mean, right now, Will's bringing up a religious Apple fan. But it's hard to pinpoint because it means so many different things for so many different people. Like, I could see how on that scale, you would say, well, uh, are you going to church? Right now, people are like, he's dancing. This man is dancing right now. I, I, well, I realize I'm, most questions, I got to dance a little bit. But, but just go with me for a second here. If we're talking about... If your scale is like how often you go to church, for example, or how often you pray, or if it's a very like traditional uh, interpretation, if you want me to interpret the question in a traditional sense, then I'm not religious. But if you can open that up, the spectrum a little bit, if we're talking about belief in general, if we're talking about discipline if we're talking about some of the pieces of a religious mindset or ideology then now you could start to move me a little bit because i do engage in that thought process to a certain extent i uh look we got so we have some answers to some questions we don't have the answers to the big one like there's a few blind spots out there you know and 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 to to go down the cliche path like th in in certain ways the more the longer i live and the more that i learn the more that i realize i don't know you see that so i start to understand the existence of religion i start to understand the mindset and the importance to a certain extent like, I just, I don't think that this topic is the bipolar, black and white thing that people, the way that people treat it. Now, I get it. You know, some people, certain experiences, some people say, look, uh, if there's benefits, the drawbacks are bigger. Or some people say, if there's drawbacks, the benefits are bigger. People want to have, it's like a lot of conversations. It's like politics. It gets very similar. They even though the answer might be in the gray zone, the gray zone don't sell. The gray zone, the land of nuance, it's a complicated land to navigate. And people want a simple message, simple set of instructions. You know, you want a you map, but there is no map. You're born, you die. Where's the map, Will? Did you find it? You know what I'm saying? Maybe the process is looking for the map knowing full well you're only going to catch it in glimpses maybe if you're lucky i don't know so your question there sir is uh, could be interpreted in a lot of ways but that's the way that i choose to interpret it i i choose to say that in one classification i i i'm i'm a zero on the religious scale but in uh in a different classification i might be a 10 so I, I've effectively answered your question without answering it at all. Good job. And I don't know why I called it effective, because I guess it's up to you whether it was effective or not. Nonetheless, nonetheless, Will, you live and then you die. That's how it goes. And in the meantime, you get to spend time. You and I, yeah. we're here. You got Otis on your lap. Things are happening. Let's focus. There's a lot to do, things to be done. We can have an effect. We can have an impact. I like to focus on that. We can have an effect. We can have a target. We spoke about it before. You know, aim to impact that which you can impact.
It doesn't have to be everything all at once. Anyway, that's a red line territory. That's his subject line. Now you're about to get all kinds of crazy questions, Willie Do, because you entertained this one. Now you know what you're going to get hit with? You don't even want to know. Yeah. Well, the weirder, the better. All right. I like, watch, I like reading them. There you have it. Willie Do, he just opened himself up to whatever you might want to throw at him. It's will at loulater.com. Send him your questions. You could get on the show as well, and we'll see you real soon.